So there's a specific cluster of those psychological and emotional nutrients that we need to get in order to grow and develop and within the kind of appropriate developmental stages. Mm -hmm. That's Olga Yakovlieva, one of the psychologists here at Shift. And my name is Zach Erickson, by the way, and welcome to another episode of The Shift Show. Uh, today, we are bringing you an episode from the archives all about toxic parenting and specifically the effect that that has on people, uh, us, right, individuals as we get older. Uh, and, you know, if you had a, a parent who displayed unhealthy parenting strategies and things like that, what effect does that have? You know, some of the things that maybe you've heard or experienced, uh, you know, we can internalize those things here at Shift. We call those limiting beliefs. And, uh, you know, we start to believe some of the things that we were taught or some of the things that we felt. And so we're going to talk all about that, what you can do about it, how to wrap your brain around it. And overall, I just appreciate the perspective that Olga brings in this episode. And it's one of the ones that we wanted to definitely bring back. And without further ado, sit back and enjoy the show. You're listening to The Shift Show, where we use psychological insight to unravel the craziness of life for you. You growth mindset person you. Tune in every other Thursday to hear some wacky psychologists demystify what exactly is happening in that weird organ that lives inside your skull. And for this especially delicious podcast experience, we can thank our friends at Shift Psych, the people who deliver a results-driven and innovative approach in therapy land. Throughout the podcast, we'll throw down some serious psych gems, but these are certainly not a replacement for treatment by a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So please seek one out if you need help. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Shift Show. My name is Zach Erickson, and today we have a really exciting episode. It's been a while. Uh, we are recording this near the end of January, and it's it's been too long, and we're sorry, and we're going to do better. Uh, today, I'm really excited. I have Olga here. Olga, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Yes. First? Hello, everyone. My name is Olga Yakovleva. I'm one of the provisionally registered psychologists here with uh, Shift, and I'm excited to do this new podcast here with Zach. Is that how we're opening 2019? That's the first podcast of yeah. 2019. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. The, the honor Happy. of being the first of the new year. Yeah. Uh, we've Happy got a really new year, everyone. Yeah. Uh, we, we've got a really. A really good episode today. Um, hopefully, it's not too heavy. We're going to be covering covering uh, a heavy topic, just a bit. So let's right? define good. <laughs> yeah, but I think hopefully it's also going to be very helpful, and I think it, a lot of people can relate to one extent or another uh, some of the things that we're talking about, which today is toxic parenting. Yeah, right, and specifically. Uh, we wanted to, to sort of give a little bit of an overview slash disclaimer about sort of the, our goal with this episode and sort of what we're aiming for. Um, I guess for Olga, you had a few things that you wanted to make sure to cover with that. Yeah, so um, just because this topic can engulf quite a bit, just we wanted to um, ensure that there will be some areas that definitely align with the concept of toxicity that we will not be dwelling too much in um, just because of the heaviness and the complexity of trauma that could be associated with that. So mainly um, things like um, abuse and um, in, uh, um, uh, anything that's associated with that. So we'll be covering co patterns of t toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, like more generally is what you're saying, exactly, right? Not yeah. the, the really... You know, when we get into, when you're talking about things like physical violence, sexual violence, sexual assault, Correct. Um, all of those kinds of things, we I think we like very briefly kind of mention them on a surface level. We're mm -hmm. not going to get super deep on it, um, but this is something that, you know, I think one of the things that I, that I kind of took away, you know, early on um, in as a psychologist and as a therapist, there was always this thing of like, oh, well, everybody has, you know, mommy or daddy issues of, yep. of some point. And that's <laughs> kind of what we're talking about today is more of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, not, And we're not going to get really deep into into some of the more intense um, or more severe things. Not to say that those aren't important. Those, I think that those just deserve their own discussion at a mm -hmm. later date. And that's why, you know, yeah. if we... 
uh, if there's uh, any concern about that, that's what we're doing. For sure, yeah. And uh, regardless of that, there's still just because of some of the areas that we will be covering, um, some of the painful emotions or disturbing memories might still come up for some people. So if, if that's something that becomes a thing, just be mindful of that. Observe, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Yeah, totally. <laughs> in those moments. Yeah. And I think uh, I think the other thing with that as well is we wanted to just acknowledge this up front because... Uh, talking about family, I think there is this, this balance that I think is really, imp- I think it comes from a really good place, honestly, <laughs> is this like, oh, well, you can't talk about my mom like that or, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing where it's, or, uh, or that somehow, I uh, that, that I need to, like, I know that my mom did a good job or my dad like did the best that he could. Uh, and I think that that's all important. Mm-hmm. Like, well, it's like, it can be something that is, you know, those are meaningful relationships in our lives, but what we don't, I think often what I see, even when we're, when, you know, with clients that that sometimes that urge to quote unquote, like stand up for your parents Protect. or defend them, yeah. right. That, 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 that also serves to kind of like invalidate your own experience about mm-hmm. that. And just because they tried their best doesn't mean that that you know that when they when they fell short that that didn't impact you in a negative way. Yeah. And both of those things can can happen at the same time and say, yeah, you know what, I I know they tried their best, but when they messed up or when they didn't when they didn't live up to you know what were you know when they fell into these toxic parenting sort of uh, patterns uh, that did affect me, and mm-hmm. it's important to acknowledge that that affected you and how that did, so that you can kind of overcome that and become better. Yeah. Uh, then and kind of shed that some of that emotional, um, you know, what we call like non nurturing elements and those limiting exactly. beliefs and things. Like yeah. That. So essentially, our goal is not to blame our parents or finger point um, to some of the areas that um, might not have been as nurturing as we would have liked them, um, but essentially just acknowledge that both have uh, the valid right to exist in our current realities. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's really like a sign of of like intellectual and emotional maturity is to be able to kind of hold both of those things at the same time. Mm-hmm. So, okay, cool. So that's, uh, so that is uh, the sort of disclaimer thing out of the way. Um, the other thing that I wanted to start with, and we try and do this as much as possible on the show is to frame this stuff. And this is the kind of thing that we're going to try and do moving forward as well is using what we kind of refer to as like the shift language and the mm-hmm. shift terminology um, to frame some of this stuff. So I wanted to give a quick sort of recap. Uh, and it, for listeners who are new to the show, I would definitely encourage you to go to, I want to say it's like one of the, I mean, the first two episodes I think are just sort of a good groundwork for uh, the philosophy that we have in general anyways. Mm-hmm. But um, the, specifically the one around limiting beliefs and dysfunctional needs. But we'll do a quick recap anyway. So It's a little refresher from yeah, 2019. Well, exactly, right? So so l- the limiting beliefs, this is sort of how I pitch it to – I don't know why I pitch it, but right how I describe it to clients. So limiting beliefs are those negative beliefs that we have about ourselves that impact how we uh, how we interpret the world around us. Right. And different situations. And the example I always come back to is I, I don't even at this point, it's such a thing that I say that I don't even have I'm not even going to find a new one. <laughs> right. It's like whatever the bad version of rose colored glasses is. Yeah. Right. That's basically it, like those colored glasses. I don't know if you've ever seen the um, have you ever seen those those kid books. You can get like the cardboard glasses with the oh, red cellophane yeah. on them. And it's like the red printed page with like blue light blue or whatever. But you put them on. It's like, whoa, it's a totally different picture <laughs> or whatever. Right. That's kind of what limiting beliefs are so and and so those limiting beliefs are things that we internalize about ourselves starting at a very early age often right and the limiting beliefs again are the result of what we would call a non-nurturing element Mm -hmm. so the non-nurturing element example that i use is dad opens the or i come in the house with muddy shoes on and mom yells at me because i'm upset Mm -hmm. or she's upset about it so that's the non-nurturing element is mom yelling at me for like a five-year-old kid. Uh, that's scary, right? Or that's like either mom doesn't like me or I'm a bad kid. Internalize those beliefs about yourself. Um, and suddenly, you know, we just start to see that everywhere and it gets reinforced. Uh, 
and then the dysfunctional need on top of that because you don't want to feel like you're not good enough, for mm -hmm. example. So now I need to be perfect so that I don't feel that way. Yeah. So so that's sort of the how that all works. Um, is the non-nurturing element being the experience that happened while, you know, during those developmental periods. Mm -hmm. And then the limiting belief being the thing that you learned about yourself or started to believe about yourself because of that. Yeah. Would you like, would you add anything to that? Yeah. So um, you summed it up fairly well. I also sometimes mention something along the lines that when we are young, like we come into the world and everything is really, really new to us. So we kind of have to figure things out really fast just so we don't die right away. Yeah. And we need to navigate our reality really quickly. So, and a lot of things happening. There's a lot of stimulation around us, ideally, uh, regardless of what the circumstances are, regardless of who are the people around us. Mm -hmm. So during those times, we also operate on more so emotional making sense of the world type of mechanism because our like, cognitive, critical, analyzing, logical self has not like, kicked in yet. And mm -hmm. it also wouldn't be to its evolutionary advantage to kick in yet. So mm -hmm. it makes sense for us to be more reactive and more... Yeah, um, and basically just whatever mom, and, whatever mom and dad say, Say, like they're here they're here to protect me and to take care of me so it's like our urge is to trust them yes it must be true yeah mm -hmm. yeah clearly they're right right like that's just how, how that's common sense yeah. yeah we yeah. we wired to trust them and to rely on them and to uh see them um as human beings who are to protect us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely uh Okay, cool. So that's, and that, that, I mean, so then when that kind of thing happens, well, clearly it's not their fault. It must mm -hmm. be my fault. Yeah. Oh, also um, another thing that I wanted to add. So it's not, sometimes it is those small little incidences and moments like muddy shoes, but sometimes it's just like the pattern of behavior as well. Mm -hmm. So like at six o'clock, dad is angry or dad, mm -hmm. there's some tension in the household and that becomes a consistent pattern mm -hmm. over time. So not sometimes, yes, it's those intense uh, episodes, but sometimes it's the cumulative impact of small little things over time. Mm, yeah, like uh, one one that I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of that I, as soon as I sort of was aware of it and started looking for it more, I think it comes up because a lot of people are like, yeah, I had a great family. It was awesome. Uh -huh. I'm like, okay, well, cool. Like, uh, you have any siblings? Yeah, yeah, I'm the youngest of four. <laughs> and it's like, okay. And then you look at, and that just sort of the having three siblings grow up ahead of you mm -hmm. and then have that constant, even if no one else is comparing them to you, you are. Yeah. And so that like, even something like that can then, you know, when we're doing the, the limiting beliefs checklist and, and looking for those, um, I am inferior mm -hmm. often comes up, mm -hmm. right. Or I don't measure up or whatever. So, uh, okay. So that's lots of sort of preamble. Let's get into the, uh, let's get into toxic parenting and toxic families and stuff like that. Like what is, when we, when we say toxic parenting, what do we mean by that? Like, what do we mean? Like, yeah. Um, so we're using the word toxic. Toxic is something that is commonly applied to the chemical field. So when we talk about mm -hmm. like toxicity within the like, chemical um, structure and context, it's something, it refers to an element that disrupts our ability to function properly and mm -hmm. deprives us of those nurturing elements that we need to develop and to grow and to be essentially well and healthy. Mm -hmm. So in a same... Yeah, I think of like poison. Exactly. Right? So it's yeah. poisonous to our, to our physical selves. Um, in the same way psychological toxicity it's the ongoing patterns of behaviors or um kind of the pattern of those small little incidents that deprives our ability to grow and develop psychologically and um especially during those times of our kind of developing say self identity developing uh esteem our ability to effectively navigate our internal environment and mm -hmm. external en environments so 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 in other words like so so in other words that it is that as we're developing, there's these natural sort of developmental things that we just naturally start to do. Like you, you mentioned, like self identity mm -hmm. and and self esteem and things like that. And as we're figuring those things out in a healthy environment, uh, or I guess maybe like a supportive environment, mm -hmm. you're you're going to build that self confidence, but but the and and just become a good functioning person. Exactly. Right? Yes. And and this toxic parenting stuff is. 
it's it's getting in the way. Yeah. So there's a specific cluster of those psychological and emotional nutrients that we need to get in order to grow and develop and within the kind of appropriate developmental stages. Mm -hmm. um, so toxic environment either um, deprives us of those mm -hmm. um, or creates a like, specific dysfunctional environment that makes it very difficult for us makes to... Us, makes it hard to... Makes it hard to do any of that, right? Exactly. Or, or we internalize and we we start to believe entirely different things, right? Going back to the so idea that's of the, the impact, of and that, the right. like those limiting beliefs often are, are where that comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So so again, the toxic parenting, non nurturing element, uh, and then the the impact of that is the limiting beliefs, dysfunctional needs, all of that stuff. Correct. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So. So how do we, like, how do you, when you think of toxic parenting, what are the, uh, I know we have different kinds of toxic parenting. What do, mm -hmm. When when you are talking to somebody about that, how do you, how do you frame this whole sort of thing then? Like, like looking at different kinds of toxic parenting and, um, and what that would look like. Cause if somebody was looking at their life and saying, okay, well, I, I don't know, like, I guess I have, you know, quote unquote mommy issues or daddy issues mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and not to like, I say that so flippantly and it's such a, like, there's a lot of connotations with that. I think it's just a common term that people use. I don't mean it like if everybody has mommy and daddy issues, it's okay. So, so just because it's a very heavy to topic, <laughs> it's okay to like, add a little dose of humor. Here. Yeah. So exactly. So like, what are the, what are the, um, what kinds of toxic parents exist out there? Yeah. Okay. So before we go there, yeah, uh, yeah. It was something that I quickly wanted to mention as you were talking about like those mommy daddy issues, um, it's usually not until we're adults that we start experiencing or being mindful and aware of the impact of that and effects that permeate in our kind of like adult day to day functioning. Um, and one of the reasons for that, I think anyways, is because when we grow up in a specific environment, we rely on our caregivers to develop a specific structure of the sense of normal. So mm. to us, we don't know any better. That is how we grew up. This is our normal. And mm -hmm. we are not aware of impact. Neither we have you know, ability um, mm -hmm. on the developmental level to have that level of insight mm -hmm. um, to know. Um, so commonly, it's not even kind of like, as you phrased it, or chosen mm -hmm. to phrase it, yeah. mommy, daddy <laughs> issues that... Brings people uh, to counseling or uh, um, makes them to seek out help. It's more so specific areas of being stuck or yeah. when they start finding um, ways or like start start being aware of the ways that, that they're functioning or their ability to even just like extract fulfillment and joy out of mm -hmm. life is being impaired. So for, whether it's kind of inability to sustain relationship for a long term. So like, you know, like, so those, like breaking up all the like yeah. constant breakups, those kinds of things. So those patterns, they have no idea why, like, yeah. yeah. So you ask the person for their like relationship history and again, oh, like, yeah, it was fine for, for a year. And then we woke up. Yeah, it was fine for like a year and a couple of months. And we, so we get the yeah. specific pattern. Another one is kind of like the striving for control or mm -hmm. like that overachieving self. So yeah. the perfectionist. One of the things, is one of the things that I see, and then maybe I'm going to get a little personal, but not too detailed because I don't know if family listens to this. Or not. <laughs> Anyways. Hi mom. Uh, so, <laughs> so, and we've had conversations about this, so it's not as big of a deal. Uh, so one of the things that I like looking at some of this stuff growing up for me, um, when you're talking about like, it feels normal. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that I grew up with in my family was this sense of, if there, if you have a problem, that the very first thing you need to think about, and and I don't think this was ever explicitly said, but this it was sort of have like to the, be said. it didn't have to be right. Um, was that like like confrontation mm -hmm. and conflict is a bad thing, mm -hmm. and if you if you are upset about something, you need to get over yourself and you need to just deal with it by yourself and don't talk about it and like. The, don't ruffle don't rock the boat don't ruffle other people's feathers mm -hmm. like you just need to you just need to get with the group and be okay yeah and um uh, and at the time it was like yeah you know what like we're a nice big happy family that's fine mm -hmm. but but when i had like legitimate concerns and issues that was something that it that it was just it was all put on me a lot of the times it felt like anyways whether that was the intent or not but um that and that i often felt like oh okay well i guess i just 
I'm now kind of feeling a little bit like an outsider or I'm feeling unsupported or like I can remember moments like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is, again, I think that that those, the sort of like a culture in a family, even it's not even, I'm not even necessarily talking about like my parents in particular, but just almost this sort of, you know, this bigger picture kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Like what are your thoughts on that? Okay. So I know we had a specific structure, but um, I think we naturally Mm -hmm. go in in the way of talking about the impact. So let's do that. Um, So when we talk about that specific version of normal, especially when we talk about confrontation, um, I think it's helpful to also start reviewing what is the ripple effect of that in different areas of your life, because Mm -hmm. confrontation is a natural way of growing. I mean, like confrontation is by itself is an uncomfortable word. Mm -hmm linguistically yeah, totally. um, and it's unpleasant place to be mm-hmm. but it's very in a grand scheme of things even if we talk about kind of like workplace environments that's where growth happens that's totally. where we find um, when we face different uh, opinions and that's where we get exposed to different points of view and mm-hmm. then we work on finding middle ground but when we have that you know, internalized thing like, oh, I can't be myself. I need to please others. I need mm-hmm. to, uh, I can't say no. So something along, or I can't express my emotions or. Yeah. So we, our like assertive self starts to um, not so much suffer, but. You shrivel up. <laughs> just a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So that tends to happen. So then, sure. like, yeah, the conformity kicks in. Um, another r- ripple effect of that would be in personal relationships or romantic relationships. Oh, another thing that can, comes to mind, it becomes very uncomfortable for one as an adult to witness uh, somebody else's distress. Totally. Especially if it's someone else who is your loved one, whether it's mom or dad, or whether it's the girlfriend, wife, mm-hmm. um, co-worker even. Um, and and who almost you're immediately with. The, the, the feeling can be like, oh, this is like, it's my responsibility to help this person deal with yes. this. Yeah. Yeah. So the urge or impulse that we get, I need to fix it. I need mm-hmm. to help. Whether it's like, I need, I need to, to, I need to shut this down and tell mm-hmm. this person to go and deal with this by themselves and like unintentionally exclude them or shun mm-hmm. them. Right. Which yeah. you totally don't want mm-hmm. or just, and we definitely cannot be receptive or attentive to, to what they need. Mm-hmm. And, right. And it's just, it's much more about like, okay, well, no, 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 no. Like regardless Whatever you need, it's like that person's needs entirely, or your own, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Your needs, like, almost entirely become unimportant because how you are feeling or how you're expressing your emotion is no longer, um, it's no longer acceptable. Acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that difficulty with confrontation could be one of the signs that mm-hmm. there were some kind of blips and flaws um not necessarily in parenting but just like in the way that was the structure um yeah. during the environment that you were growing uh, growing up with not you in particular but just in general too yeah, you can be me, that's um right. <laughs> yeah since we're not personal topic um another thing that um uh, just a bit of like trail off from that um it's important to acknowledge the social aspects and culture in which the parenting happens. Oh, totally. Too, because that can have quite an impact. What we think, okay, in parenting right now Mm -hmm. um, might not have been what was okay earlier mm-hmm. uh, and vice versa as well. Yeah. Like, I see this a lot. Spanking like, comes to mind, but we're not yeah. going to go into that oh, like too much. I think, I think, uh, I think in particular as well, like I see that a lot with, with uh, when I'm working with couples where maybe one comes from an in- immigrant family or something mm. like that, where just like the, the difference between a focus on the individual versus a focus on the collective group or mm-hmm. family, like that can have a big influence on how, how we deal with concerns yeah. in a relationship too. Mm-hmm. So, so what discipline is and how mm-hmm. it's um, how it manifests itself can mm-hmm. have a, like, a number of cultural connotations too. Totally. Like also like, not only like culturally per se, but generationally too, even like here. Oh, yeah. If we were to trace it back, like things looked quite different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being in Alberta, right, with a, with a, a big sort of um, – I, I guess maybe maybe not Alberta in general. I'm not going to throw the entire province uh, into that, but yeah, you know, I think that especially in those more rural areas or, or things like that, sometimes that that is more, you know, like you, know, you just kind of be tough kind of thing, right? And, mm-hmm. and just deal with things in that way, and they're are not necessarily as sensitive to that. Not mm-hmm. not even because that they're negligent about it, but just that's just like you said, that's the culture, that's sort of yeah. the norm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
so yeah, so let's get into some of these toxic parent uh, parenting, um, the different kinds that I think that maybe people can just sort of identify. Did these kinds of things happen? Um, and and again, not necessarily not necessarily with the intent of like then taking this and saying, "See, mom and dad, I told you you were terrible parents." Like that's mm-hmm. that's not. But more of, okay, well, when that happens, these are the kinds of things that can that can show up. Um, again, as limiting beliefs or as as things that we struggle with. Yeah. So another one that comes to mind is control piece. Mm. So we might reflect back on some on some of the um, parenting styles, and we can like, we we often hear things like whether in sessions or in social lives. Oh, like my parents are overly controlling, or like we're overly controlling. And this could be quite a the gray area as well, um, because the control again can come from the warmest place in their hearts they naturally totally. want to shield their kids from mm-hmm. um being either exposed to negative environments um oftentimes though it's also a reflection of parental fears and anxieties yeah. and a reflection on something that they've been through and it's just being projected onto the kids which again like the vessel that is the positive intention they want their kids to avoid um, mm-hmm. or not to go through what they've gone through yeah the unfortunate impact of that is that permeated fear uh, mm-hmm. that is commonly kind of like stems and ends up like guiding child's and later on adult ability to navigate their environment, whether it's mm-hmm. social environments, whether it's um, other relationships, yeah. the ability to advance career-wise, all of that stuff. Yeah, so like taking that, sort of giving that responsibility to the child to sort of, or I guess not even responsibility, but like the... the the trust or the like giving the benefit of the doubt, mm-hmm. you know, kind of thing of like, okay, well, Hey, you know what? You make that decision. And, um, cause, and I think again, like you said, that, that, that controlling parents can be, um, I think, I think if it sometimes comes from a place of, like you said, fear. Uh, it, and I think especially it, when, when the parent thinks that they knows what's, what is best for the child, which very well could be true. Mm-hmm. Right. But, but then to to force that child out of a decision, mm-hmm. it can be a very difficult, um, a very difficult thing to for the child to a understand, and and b like they're not learning the lesson instead of you know really what we want to do is as and again I'm also kind of <laughs> I should have said this earlier but also as a parent right mm-hmm. like as a parent now I think looking at that and saying, okay, well, instead, I want to help, I want to sit down and talk my kid through this mm-hmm. and help them understand this is what I think is the right idea. This is why I think that's the right mm-hmm. I- the right way to do it. What do you think, right? And mm-hmm. and actually get the, the child to talk about it and ask about it. Like, those are the kinds of things where we're, we're nurturing the child to, to kind of make the, learn those decision-making skills on their own and to, to, to be able to trust their own uh, judgment moving forward. Yeah. Uh, and it also sort of builds that relationship at the same time. Yeah. So they become those active participants in that decision making process and they have a certain degree of autonomy and control for that matter mm-hmm. um, in what's going to happen. Um, what, as you were describing that, another thing that came to mind was, um, and again, it might be stemming from the generational gap too. Um, some, or majority of the generations. So th- that lack of knowledge of the developmental stages oh, totally. and what on what kids are capable of knowing or not knowing. There was something else you were talking about earlier, and I think it was around the muddy shoes example. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there are times early in our lives when we don't have the ability to verbally communicate our feelings, neither can uh, understand what's happening. So we, again, operate on that emotional making sense of the yeah. world mechanism. So emotions become very... Um, intense and very um, prominent tool in our ability to uh, figure out what's happening. Oh yeah, um, and and to push back against the world too, right? Mm-hmm. Like uh, <laughs> this is a, this is a sidebar, but my I have a six year old daughter, and she's getting better at this. But she <laughs> she went through a stage where when she didn't like what we were telling her, the only thing that she could do is clench her fists and scream as loud as she could, mm-hmm. and we we're like. Okay. Uh, well, uh, well, you know, we'll guide her through it, right? But just sort of like, um, but again, like you're saying that 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 the emotions are sometimes all that that 
very young kids even have. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So depending, going back to the control thing, so depending on how intense the degree um, of control is when we were growing up, so it can go um either one of two ways either adults grow up being very fearful of making their own decisions and it makes it um, very difficult for them to kind of regain that sense of autonomy when they're mm -hmm. older and even kind of like knowing what what self is what mm -hmm. they want what their desires are mm -hmm. um, and another ripple effect of that is over reliance on others for making um, those decisions mm -hmm. which if you would go back to romantic relationships piece too can mm -hmm. um, have um, quite an impact. It can so you say like over reliance, yeah. like when you say like over reliance on others, so like basically not trusting yourself, not trusting what, yourself, seeking that external validation constantly, yeah, like, um, seeking that reassurance piece as well. Yeah. It's like, um, what do you think? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah, okay. stuff like that. Okay, so so controlling parents, those can be that that's one kind. What else we we said before? What what are some of the other ones? Yeah, let's talk about the complete opposite, the uninvolved parents. Yeah. So when there is lack of guidance, lack of structure, uh, no clear set expectations, um, those are parents that are often emotionally unavailable as well. Mm -hmm. And again, not to pathologize like small little like blips and flaws in parenting. Um, so it could be it's a spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. So for um, commonly, it, it stems from parents being overwhelmed with their own issues and concerns. Again, like, and you can speak to that way more mm. than I do. Parenting mm. is freaking hard. No, oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so it can be quite overwhelming. There could be instances where it just gets too much. Yeah, and so the like I've I've heard it before referred to as like a permissive parent, right? Mm -hmm. Like somebody who a parent who, uh, and who basically, you know. The kids kind of just left to their own devices. Yeah. Right. And it's like that almost sort of like flapping in the wind a little bit mm -hmm. of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I guess I'm just going to hang out. And I, I think that there is there is sort of that balance of of um, giving the child freedom, but also having structure. And what you're saying is in this particular situation, um, there's no structure like the, yeah. the like it's just very. um yeah, they're just not being a parent. Yes. And ironic thing of that, usually people report um, or usually people have very fond memories of their childhood when that was the case. So it's uh, the situation where they would um, live in like, the geographically isolated areas, so like acreage or a farm. Mm -hmm. um, the parents were like, fairly preoccupied with everything else that was going on. Or um, when there are like, many kids in a household or mm -hmm. the blended family. So there's a lot going on. Um, yeah. And a lot of times, well, considering the... Uh, in general household mm -hmm. that was the term, functional the, 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 the common term as well i think i've heard before is like you call them like latchkey kids mm. right just the, the, like you just did your own thing and like you could leave you know sort of go and and hang out and you didn't have to tell your parents where you were you mm -hmm. didn't have to and i think that again that that balance of sure we trust you but also um there's a difference between we trust you let us know when you're going to be home all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. versus being um you know, negligent or, or, not, right. or like, and, and when I say negligent, I think there's lots of different things, but mm -hmm. I think it's just kind of like, a that there are certain, like, what are the kinds of things that maybe a child would need that they're not getting in this situation? So something that comes to mind would be emotional security um, or responsiveness. So like what, would, it, what, like, what does that look like? So you do whatever you do in the field and you trip and your ankle hurts like hell and there's no one around. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody to help you. Exactly. There's yeah. no one to express your emotions to. You don't know who to go. You don't know where mom is. You don't know where dad is. Um, you don't know mm -hmm. like, where like where there are other siblings might be around, but they might not know what to do or how to respond to the situation because of their developmental mm -hmm. um, age, or they might not be around. So stuff like that. In those instances, when you feel that you need that, you need to reach out for that emotional comfort and security, mm -hmm. and but that's not available. Mm -hmm. So the default of that is then you internalize belief i am alone or i'm yeah. not needed i'm not important mm -hmm. and yeah i don't matter i don't matter um, mm -hmm. those kinds of things which then the dysfunctional need from that is um i need to be independent right or mm -hmm. i need to do it by myself or i can't rely on other people mm -hmm. um i need to please everyone mm -hmm. right like like those are all 
pieces in there that for sure. Yeah. And then we start as adults that starts manifesting itself in fear of depending on someone else, fear mm -hmm. of asking for help, uh, fear of uh, attaching to someone else because um, that moment of being abandoned during the time when it, you were in that excruciating pain, mm -hmm. even if it's not was physical pain, but it kind of feels crappy when oh, yeah. you're alone and you need something. You don't know what's going on with everyone else, but you're all by yourself. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah. you just kind of like, oh, well, I guess I just need to learn how to deal with that, which, mm -hmm. you know, there is a, there is, I think a certain, there's a healthy version of that and then an unhealthy version of that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you like learning the value of independence is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if the, if that is also paired with, no, I need to be independent because everybody's going to be, everybody else is going to disappoint me anyways. And I just need to, I just need to deal with it myself because I don't want to open myself up to other people mm -hmm. disappointing me. Like that's an entirely different kind of um, it, like unhealthy independence maybe, or like isolation. Really. Exactly. And you're creating that cluster of expectation. So next time crappy things going to happen. I'm on my own. Yeah. There is no one going to be who helped me. Or if they will, I better not rely on them because who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. I think maybe it'd be helpful as well to kind of go back to the one that we did before with the with the controlling parents and kind of talk about it in that framework of the limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. dysfunctional needs thing. Um, what are some of the ones that you see with that one? Uh, in terms of not being in control? Yeah, or the like the parents, the parents being controlling. Yeah, so that's when you're being told what to do and how to do it. So in situations like that, your sense of agency um, mm -hmm. gets deprived quite a bit. So in terms of limiting beliefs, you start developing things like, um, well, I'm not in control. Duh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't be myself. I can't trust um mm. others i'm not good enough i'm not good enough yeah. um i'm inferior i'm incapable as well oh yeah because well like if someone else is always making decisions for you like mm -hmm. how strong is your ability of um relying on yourself and those decision making mm -hmm. um times would be mm -hmm. yeah yeah which then like that i'm not in control is definitely would fuel that need for validation or, mm -hmm. or that i'm inferior that like that validation that well, I can't trust myself, so I guess I need to check with everybody else kind of thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and in regards to the need that also develops this strong attachment to the sense of structure, to the sense of having um, a plan um, in life and for the day, for the month, for the week. And we end up being like super rigid mm -hmm. and inflexible and... Oh, yeah, that's what I was somebody, talking about. And somebody, if somebody like... If if something changes last minute, like yep. oh right, because wait a minute, now I don't know. Like this was the thing that I was supposed to do, and there's a certain way that things go. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I ever learned how to deal with this was by doing what other people told me to do. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it's either that, so that strong clinginess to structure and that very rigid inflexibility, or the completely opposite of having that very averse reaction to structure. So like mm -hmm. being overly spontaneous, being like that go with the flow, like poor time management skills, mm -hmm. because sure, yeah. you want to like, overcompensate for how intense things were like when you were a kid. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. So those are, those are the first two, the controlling parents, the sort of permissive, inadequate, like absent parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, what else? Uh, also it oftentimes happens when, uh, so we were talking about role reversal mm -hmm. thing. So there are what now do you, like role reversal, meaning like the parent becomes the child, the child yeah, becomes the parent. So, and it's not until people are adults when it starts manifesting itself in different relationships, uh, especially with your parents when you start realizing, okay, like I'm mothering my mom or I'm taking care of everyone in the mm. family. Um, so it can stem from a number of different things, uh, ranging from the like seemingly small and insignificant parents being overwhelmed uh, with uh, chores responsibilities themselves. Mm. Um, I've, the I've seen this financial I've, situation. Yeah, I've seen this one uh, often. And I mean, you can you could like, I think this the the sort of stereotypical version of this, um, especially it with male clients, sometimes like maybe a good analogy would be the oldest son after mom and dad get a divorce. Oh yeah, and he's good now example. the man of the house, mm -hmm. and he is now like got to take care of 
mom and like make sure that he's and i think again being supportive sure right but but um if that there if mom kind of goes into a deep depression after the divorce or something Mm. like that it's like regardless of if it's the if if it's the oldest son or not right or or the oldest daughter or um or whatever it is right whatever's going on that that the kids then have to step up and and almost take over for mom. Yeah. Uh and and look whether like there's there's hints of permissive parenting in there um because maybe mom's going through her own stuff uh but also yeah that she's she's also kind of you know there's almost a step further where she's now being taken care of by maybe mm-hmm. very young kids sometimes. Yeah, and usually because by that time kids grow to be very attuned Mm -hmm. to the emotions of others. Some of the common things that get internalized is I'm responsible for everybody Mm -hmm. um, or it's my fault. Um, The unfortunate consequence of that, kids start to learn to deprioritize their own needs and Mm -hmm. they go in a back burner and the needs of an adult um, get on the forefront. Mm -hmm. So kids learn to adapt their behavior and their own emotional expression to match, to make sure that the parent is okay. Because how it works in our head is, well, if mom is not happy, then like my safety, my security, my ability to grow and develop is compromised. And of course it's not happening like in that um, Mm -hmm. shape and form in our head, but this is how the internalization happens. Totally. And also like the piece of I'm in capable lurking in the background there too, because what happens is, Kids are being put in a position where they're expected to perform the duties and responsibilities that are simply not accessible. The skill that's required for them is simply not accessible to them at that age. So whether it's like so, we're talking about mm-hmm. some practical things like washing the dishes when you are like four or five or comforting an adult who's in distress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. And And like all of those kinds of things where it's just, I think even things like. And I like packing your own lunch or Mm -hmm. like making dinner and all those kinds of things that, that, and I think maybe part of, of this as well is that, is that it's one thing if the parent is there teaching the child along the way and learning to do that and building that independence at an age that's appropriate, but it's something else where the kid basically like where you know, it's like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to make myself a sandwich then uh, I'm hungry. Right. And and doing it because, again, hints of the of the last one of the 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 inadequate sort of absent parent, but um, but even more severe or in different ways. Mm-hmm. So. I do not deserve is also a common belief yeah. that gets internalized during time. Yeah, and you are you nailed it on the head when you said there is a difference between like oh like well let's cook like make cookies and do we do it together so you encourage that healthy growth and by default you're nurturing that sense of responsibility in a healthy way and it's completely another thing when kid wake up wakes up and well I'm hungry like it's noon I haven't eaten yet yeah. I'm gonna go look to see what's in the fridge and yeah. you know, tend to their own needs. Yeah. Yeah, I'm invisible another one that can Yeah, there you go. Ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh and uh yeah, so what what else what other what other kinds of we've got mm-hmm. a couple more. Yeah, uh another one would be criticism. So parents who um impose a bit unrealistic expectations for achievement and mm-hmm. when criticism comes into play. Um so uh, one of the by far most common um statements that i hear where's the other 10 percent remember mm. that one? Oh yeah like yeah. The, the school paper kind of thing right where where they bring the exam home or they bring the report card home it's mm-hmm. like hmm, a minus mm-hmm. what right like yeah. and it's just like or like it, i brought home an a where's the a plus mm-hmm. you could have done an a plus it's like yep. oh my, really mm-hmm. and that's the only thing that's there like not even uh not even uh um like a uh, any sort of praise necessarily for it or any congratulations you should be proud of yourself you worked so hard like none of that is there it's just immediately like you said where's the other 10 percent? yes so and again it can be coming from the place of good intentions parents want their, their kids to achieve they want them to strive they want them to um, be successful and do good things in their life so uh, Commonly, just in general, when we talk about toxic parents and some of the, the disruptions in that in that dynamic, it's not so much 
what was said or what was done, but the how yeah. uh, piece of that, how was ex- executed, what mm-hmm. were, um, uh, how were the words selected, mm-hmm. how was it felt um, at the time when something was said along those lines. Another one mm-hmm. is kind of like the, um, where criticism um comes through is comparing a kid to someone else. So like, yep. oh, like, but look at Johnny. They're yeah. like, la, la, la. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why can't you be more like your sister or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. And I, I think, um, yeah. I think and that it, one, like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just insert the blank? <laughs> yeah. And I think from like, a, so this is an interesting one because I actually was working with uh, with a client this week, um, and part of it was actually a couple, and and part of what they one of the things that we were talking about and dealing with was that when life gets stressful, especially when you've got little kids at home, um, I think it's important for parents to be aware of their own, uh, what I call like your like outside your your what would you call like your your own self talk, mm. but out loud, right? Where it's just like, internal oh, it critic. Just, no, no, more of just like the like. So, for example, like, oh, I'm the only one who ever does anything around here, and mm. and like that kind of thing, where it's like that that you kind of are it, like kind of you're talking more to yourself, but also in uh, again, the parent is like in a passive aggressive kind of way, almost like nobody ever does anything, and this and that, and, and just sort of uh, that those kinds of things. I think we especially uh, like we can. Parents sometimes forget that their kids can hear that and they know what that means. And it's, you know, they kind of fall into a pattern of that's just a way of coping with the situation at the time. Mm -hmm. And they don't even mean it as like a, as like a, as a, as an intentional criticism. It's just sort of their way of expressing their emotion at the time. Mm -hmm. But the child sure doesn't know that. right? (laughs) Right. The child is taking all of these notes of, you know, and like really internalizing all of this and, oh, well, I must be an idiot then. Mm-hmm. Like I must be lazy. I must be selfish stupid. and stupid and like all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I think that those are those are definitely. I'm so glad you mentioned the internal voice. Um, another thing that I commonly talk to clients about is we have this natural urge to believe everything that comes to mind everything that we think everything that we tell ourselves and it becomes that kind of perpetual pattern of how we see ourselves both internally and externally Mm -hmm. something that's important to pay attention is before those internal voices became internal they were external at some point so we internalize them somehow whether we're parents whether we're friends whether we're social media um whatever yeah one of those sources we don't and our parents are are First. Well, I guess our primary our primary caregiver, whoever mm-hmm. it is, yeah, uh, is almost always. No, I would even say I, I almost <laughs> hesitate to say almost. Right, like that's just naturally what's going to happen mm-hmm. is that a version of your parents gets internalized and. We kind of it can yeah. it shapes how you think mm-hmm. in general. Another thing that I wanted to quickly comment on um, to alleviate a, a little bit of the blame of parents because I feel like we're like smashing them quite a bit here. Yeah. Um, is also which could be quite a generational thing too. It's not until recently that it became apparent from like neurological standpoint yeah. and just research that kids remember stuff when from when they were young yeah it's not until like what like a generation ago or like what, if like that 60s yeah. or like yeah i don't know look for it was the first one that that started like, right that but that was if you were idea. on the cutting edge and you were learning these things yeah. as they were coming out right like to exactly. have that information actually permeate culture and our society in general mm-hmm. I feel like we still have work to do mm-hmm. in the, yeah <laughs> it's but, especially in certain areas of the uh, of the world, for Not sure. Not until recently, we actually started to realize that like, kids remember th- things from when they were super young. But mm-hmm. up until now, like it wasn't a thing. Yeah. And hence, everything that was happening in our childhood that is Absolutely. manifesting themselves in adulthood. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, criticism. Um, I think we're, we're about to wrap up, but I wanted to quickly talk about uh, the... Uh, manifestation of criticism in adulthood, which is the intense perfectionism. Yeah, so the limiting belief of I'm not good enough, um, I'm wrong, I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. Um, What other ones? I will feel there's something wrong with me. Um, Another one that I'm incapable. Yeah. Um, Yeah. um, I'm unlovable, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. Oh, I'm not understood, which also fits with um, I'm uh, uninvolved parents that we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
I fight with my clients sometimes when we talk about perfectionism because there's that <laughs> yeah uh, there's that natural tendency to save to save guard that uh, the ability to achieve and overachieve which makes total sense because it gives you results mm -hmm. and it's usually those higher achievers who go far in their life mm -hmm. and who um achieve um and accomplish um high goals yeah but somehow they still feel miserable in the process yeah so it's not so much the trait of perfectionism that we want to focus here, but where it stems from. So in other words, not the weeds that grow, so yeah. because perfectionism is, is, a, is a symptom, it's a side effect, but the seed from which it yeah. got planted, what's motivating it? Are you doing the, um, are you running a marathon because you really want to, that's your authentic desire, or because are you afraid of how crappy you're going to feel if you want, because mm -hmm. you'll feel that sense of failure, or because you feel... Yeah. Um, yeah, the way, yeah, for sure. Like the way that I'll describe it too is I think it's important to differentiate because some of these limiting beliefs and dysfunctional needs and things like that, like I think perfectionism is the perfect example. I think that we can internalize as well. Like there are some positive things or like we, it, it also can instill positive values in us mm -hmm. that can't, like you said, can be very helpful. Right. And, and I, I find reframing it as like, okay, well that's like, if you grew up and you learned, I always want to make sure that I'm doing my best and I'm living up to my potential and I'm and I'm working hard. Like those are all great things, and mm -hmm. we're not trying to get rid of those. Like the, absolutely, hold on to that and and live your life in a way that you feel like 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 you're being your best self. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, don't do it out of this out of this fear that you have to prove yourself or that you are somehow worth less mm -hmm. if you if you make a mistake or if you, if you, you know, decide or if you fail something or, you know, you know, if you fall short, that's okay. That's part of the process too. Mm -hmm. And, and that being perfect is not the goal. It's just, it's just doing the best that you can. Um, and, but also valuing your own self and knowing mm -hmm. what you want and need in life. So. Yeah. So if you find us yourself, find it, uh, mm, if it's very difficult for you to be content with where where you at, success wise or career wise or anything else, and you feel that constant need to strive and do something else, so it's hard to pause and acknowledge and savor and accept mm -hmm. all of the acknowledgement, mm -hmm. all of the uh, successes, sorry, mm -hmm. um, and achievements. It could be a good sign that is that perfectionism is rooted rooted a little bit deeper in those anxieties and fears that's standing from the earlier times of that development. Yeah. Um, also, the signs of kind of like overscheduling yourself, like being constantly busy, not being mm -hmm. able to relax, not being able to kind of like sit down and be like, okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those times when you like get to like sunny destination and you're like, okay, to-do list. Like I need yeah. to go to the beach. I need to check yeah. out the buffet. I need to do that. I need to do all of those things. So, so you still, yeah. so the unfortunate thing with vacations and the like, inability to relax, you bring your brain with you. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think that that's a, a, a good way of kind of thinking of, of it as well. And I think that different people have different paces and things like that too. And I think that mm -hmm. you find what's right. But I think again, the, the goal of like the the fear or I, I guess like the guilt piece is the the piece that we want to get rid of so mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. uh so what do we what else do we want to say before we wrap up like what are the things like what do we do about this so let's say we you know listener at home is has kind of identified with some of the stuff that we're talking about today like mm -hmm. what are some mm -hmm. things before we wrap up uh, in just a few minutes that we can talk about of what do you do about it? Yeah. So one of the first steps that can be helpful to take in situations when you recognize those patterns is to acknowledge the impact mm -hmm. again, without judgment or criticism. And it can be quite natural to have those reactions of you know, like anger towards your parents or some resentment that often kind of bubbles up, um, but acknowledging and accepting that impact. So caveat here with acceptance, oftentimes people find it difficult to accept things because um, in our head acceptance parallels with agreement mm -hmm. so it's hard to accept things because we feel that it means that we agree with the thing that was wrong mm -hmm. and that's not the case we can still yeah. disagree we don't have yeah. to forgive uh we yeah just kind of look at it and say you know i 
kind of frames like, like it is what it is mm-hmm. it happened mm-hmm. there's nothing i can do to go back and change it all i can mm-hmm. do now at this point is is acknowledge it deal with it you know don't hide from it mm-hmm. don't pretend it didn't happen like it did happen and that and it did impact you and just mm-hmm. what i hear you saying is just acknowledging that that happened um, so that you can then kind of move on and, and, and begin to address it. Yeah, and in terms of addressing uh, from acknowledgement of the impact comes also very natural question. Well, like now what? Like this happened, that happened. Um, the thing that mom said was not okay and now I don't know who I am and what I want. Yeah. So kind of the next uh, step, and it's not the like, consecutive steps. Those are the things that can happen in any order. Like, you do you, like, do whatever fits for you. Um, it's you know, starting the road of self-definition. So starting exploring like, what do you like? What do you enjoy? What brings your um, some fulfillment into your life? What are some of those things? So essentially... Um, like all those, all, those, all those questions that maybe you ask other people mm-hmm. for, like actually defining those things yourself. Yes. Or if you're worried, like I have to please everyone. It's like, okay, well, like what would this look like if you only had to please yourself? Mm-hmm. Right? Like what... Like it, what I hear you saying is like that external sort of other people, they are the standard that I have to live up to or they're mm-hmm. defining what that standard is, taking that onto yourself and saying, no, 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 like I get to decide what's r- what feels right in my life and who mm-hmm. I want to be yeah. and what my values are. And that's how I, that's the stick I'm going to or the, the level I'm going to measure myself mm-hmm. to. Yeah. And hold the standard that I'm going to hold myself to. For sure. What What is good enough? What is good enough according to your standards? But that also involves the background work or de- on developing your st- standards, which counts from that kind of like self-definition piece too. And like the, what your values are and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Values, principles, beliefs. What is that that makes you you? And sometimes it might take quite a bit of work to figure that out, mm-hmm. especially when we've been conditioned for a very long time like years sometimes mm-hmm. on end to deprioritize our own needs and to prioritize the needs and wants and preferences of other people. Yeah. And, and again, like that, like that's work to work through that mm-hmm. stuff, right? To, yeah. to make that, because basically what you're doing is you're creating networks and, and channels in your brain that are not there yet. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's sometimes going to feel like you're walking through knee deep snow and you could be walking on this nicely packed trail. Right. Um, but that's, but that's that is good work to do because mm-hmm. it's going, the more you do it, the the easier it will be in the future. So yeah, another process that is very important to engage in again, depending on where you're at with your parents right now. Um, some of parents might not be around, depending on like, what the quality of the relationship is. Boundary setting. Mm-hmm. So figuring out like what, how far is too far? Where are some of the limits and relationship? And I'm talking about basic stuff too. So like day to day interaction. Like what are what is it okay for like mom or dad and the caregiver, like whoever, to say what's not okay? What are you willing to do when that happens? And what is going to be um, your action plan when your boundaries are pushed. Um, if it's, and I know we didn't talk about the kind of like violence and abusive situations, if developing a safety plan um, is in order, then yeah, by all means, that is something that is important to incorporate as well. And we're not talking uh, just about physical safety, but emotional safety, psychological safety, financial safety, if um, um, yeah. kind of like financial mm-hmm. money manipulation piece is, mm-hmm. is there too. Um, so really like working on um, developing those. Um, again, come directly connected to values, beliefs, principles of what makes you you. Um, it's important to also acknowledge the fact that setting boundaries and working on all of those um, areas, it's a process. It's not an event. It's not its not unrealistic, which might be hard to digest for mm-hmm. our really perfectionist yeah. uh, listeners. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not a, uh, an event. It's a process. Become, yeah, we become perfectionistic about mm-hmm. overcoming our perfectionism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, and I, I think to kind of go with what you're saying, too, what I would um, – from before with the, with the safety planning, I definitely – if you find yourself in that kind of a situation, I think really the next step is is you know hopping or finding what the resources are in your area mm-hmm. for people who might be in that situation yeah. because because it can feel like you're alone. It can feel like that's like the that you are um, you know and it, like if if you are currently in a situation with abusive parents, right? Um, with especially you know if there are any sort of like adolescent 
people in our audience as well, adolescent people, right? Mm-hmm. Teens. What what are the you call, kids call it this day? <laughs> right. Anyways, the the idea that that like helping like what those individuals need is resources and and support, and mm-hmm. so. Uh, doing your research and, and reaching out to trusted people, I think, is really Yeah, important. so generating that insight and awareness, um, self-educating yourself on what are some of the most common patterns. I know we just uh, touched the tip of the iceberg here, so, so it goes yeah. way deeper, yeah. and there is quite a broad spectrum. Um, but uh, seeking help, uh, getting that uh, external opinion, whether it's professional, whether it's some of the other external supports. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of other concepts that's uh, that are important to pay attention to is um, things like response responsibility, safety choices. When we talk about responsibility, so taking the time to assign the correct responsibility to uh, what was going on when you were younger and how it happened and what is the impact on you right now. Um, Because it's not uncommon to internalize the fault uh, of what happened, which breeds the whole other realm of emotional reactions like shame, guilt. So like Mm -hmm. what you're saying is, uh, and, and I think that this is actually a really great thing that you can do in therapy too Mm -hmm. like i think that that's a big thing that we can do is how i kind of describe it to people is when you talk about that responsibility right like that maybe that situation um you know are because like we talked about before in a young as in a young child they're going to interpret that situation as their fault Mm -hmm. right and it's almost like that memory gets stored there and like gets stuck in that sort of thing. And we believe it because we never really went back and thought about it after that. Yep. We just assume that it's true because that's the part, that's how that memory was stored. Was this And that's is what my we fault. wired to do in that exactly. age. Exactly. Yeah. And so part of that then is to then in reflecting back on those experiences and thinking, hang on, like if I, you know, you know, bring my adult self into this memory and, and interpret it again, mm-hmm. what would be, how would I interpret this as an adult now? Mm-hmm. And it's like, that, how how this other per you know how mom or dad or grandma or whatever how they dealt with this situation mm-hmm. was not okay yeah and i was and remembering you were like a five-year-old kid in this memory yeah right like that's all of that is important and uh and assigning that responsibility appropriately mm-hmm. yeah yeah and so essentially imagining that memory and imagining that you walk in in on that scene as an adult and yeah. what are your thoughts now how yeah. would you react to it now yeah. so kind of reframing that through the adult looking glasses totally like yeah. the situation mm-hmm. yeah for sure um another one that popped into mind uh was when you were talking uh, about the emotional expression sometimes p- uh, kids are being explicitly told told things like well you made me upset mm-hmm. um or i am disappointed mm-hmm. and that by default sets in, in our head as in i'm responsible for other people's emotions i'm responsible for making mom happy because literally that's what they were told exactly yeah and it's like no that's not that's not okay right mm-hmm. like especially in really abusive situations um you know where there's where there's abusers right like mm-hmm. the kind of oh well this is your fault and you have it coming mm-hmm. uh though that no like that like if that's the kind of thing that's there like that is not okay and that is not the case at all yeah right? like, like like any any kind of behavior does not justify abuse no right in any form right so yeah um speaking of which and another thing that another step that to take going forward is safety piece um so we talked about responsibility so next one is safety our ability to self-regulate and go from like extreme emotional response to um like that content and peaceful self can be quite disrupted when we grow up in unpredictable or unstable like, chaotic environments yeah. um whether we're talking about like physical abuse or just like emotionally unpredictable circumstances like when there was a lot of tension growing up so because your your brain is your brain is basically designed to protect you from future danger by um uh, by basing all of that or it does that by basing it all of your past experiences mm-hmm. right? and you get stuck in that hypervigilance yeah you just you're just looking for everything exactly yeah, yeah you're scanning for dan- danger all yeah, the time totally yeah so again that involves a process a process not an event yeah. to rewire your brain to allow itself to be safe when you are safe mm-hmm. um and again we're talking about emotional safety so kind of like reconnect- stress reduction mm-hmm. techniques like yeah yeah like so maybe some good like breathing exercises or grounding grounding yeah all of that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. so that ability to be present uh, safe in the present moment Mm -hmm. for sure and and even acknowledging my body is trying to protect me right now my body thinks i'm in danger 
But that logical part of my brain is telling me I'm not actually in danger. Mm -hmm. And like, thank you, body, for Mm -hmm. protecting me, for for getting me through that terrible situation back then. I'm okay right now, though. Yeah. And you don't need to remind – you don't need to – like, you don't need to treat this situation like it's Mm -hmm. that situation. It's okay to just – Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm good. Right? Good example like, of yeah. engaging in that internal dialogue for yeah. sure. Yeah. And another one is acknowledging your choices. So that's more like when we're looking um, at the future steps too. Um, so really working on regaining that sense of control of who you are, what you can do, what you cannot do, what you can control, what you can control. Um, and really kind of like reviewing your past with intention to uh, reconnect yourself with those choices that you can make going forward from the, um, from the point of that self-agency independence mm-hmm. and being um, pro what, yeah what i hear you saying is like being proactive mm-hmm. um about taking those taking those things that you're working with um or or these issues that maybe are continuing to go on and, mm-hmm. and acknowledging and really taking that time to reflect on what are what are my options here like what choice mm-hmm. do i want to make mm-hmm. um and and being intentional about that and like like being very deliberate and almost calculated in yeah, a way of, exactly. how you, of how you're going to deal with that. Yeah. So. Oh, and another thing before I forget, when we talk about that self-definition, another area that's important to pay attention to is your needs. Um, mm-hmm. We briefly talked about how they often get prioritized. So sometimes it um, helps to take time. And even if like writing them down is a thing, so like writing down of the needs that you feel were not met for you when you were a kid, whether it was like up until you were five, up until you were 10, 15, doesn't matter. And what is the impact of that now? and what are your needs right now and how they can be met through mm-hmm. a number of different um, resources, um, areas of your life, areas of your functioning and how you can introduce that enjoyment and fulfillment back. Mm-hmm. Um, also, and like asking uh, yourself, what was your role in that household and um, what were some of the needs that were deprioritized as the default? So you can start kind of reconnecting yourself with that um, mm-hmm. authentic self as a result and just generally yeah i think just generally kind of taking that time to reflect on situations that were that were difficult or that you kind of you know your brain naturally kind of goes to certain certain moments or certain situations and really just thinking how do i feel about how that all went down what Mm -hmm. did i need at the time what i hear you saying Mm -hmm. is that and what do i need now in order to be able to kind of move move beyond this yeah there is a lot of talk um and commercialization of self-care piece um and i'm i tend to be quite skeptical of that because there is a lot of like self-help books there is um i reprimand my clients when they google (laughs) self-care like never google self-care um and one of the reasons why is that why is that why don't we okay so one of the reasons for that is because we can get into that realm of shoulds well i should be going to the gym i should be reading i should be all doing that so we end up doing all of those things that are supposedly good for us and supposedly nurturing Mm -hmm. but then we end up kind of like losing our shit when the waiter mixes up our drink or whatever um so i think and well i strongly believe that we need self-care is good so i want to like a disclaimer sure like, yeah it's, it's good but we need to approach it from the standpoint of reviewing our values beliefs uh goals needs don't do so, it just because you should do it yes. but because okay well if this is something that seems like something i'm gonna do why is that so important to me yes why, and what do i feel like do i want to put all of this pressure on myself to do it or is it more important to just you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm do something you know do the best that i can here Mm -hmm. and uh, i i find with a lot of the self-help realm um i think with with, like with a lot of things in in psychology if it works for you in a positive way that improves your life then it works for you yes and if it does but don't force it don't feel like you have to just create this huge list of check boxes to in order to do this it i think it's very much learning to trust your own self and Mm -hmm. And figuring out what you need to, to move forward. Yeah, so essentially the goal is to create that individualized, personalized toolkit of things that work yeah. just for you because of who you are and what you like and what totally. makes you happy. That is so cheesy, but... Yeah, yeah no, but really, the like, that's the whole... On. Like, I think, I think that that's, that that's exactly it, right? Is that and, and not even healthy, but just sort of, like, content and living a, a fulfilled, positive existence, Yeah. right? And kind of and free of these limiting beliefs and, and, and that you're actually able to live life as it actually is yeah without yeah. disruptor 
Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Shift Show. Be sure to check out our website, shiftpsych.com, for more great content to help you optimize your life. Follow us on social media at shiftpsych, and let us know if you have ideas or things you'd really like to hear about on the podcast. If you found this useful or interesting, which you probably did since you're still here, please share and review the show. And make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This lets us know that you like what you hear so we can bring you more of it. The podcast was brought to you by Shift Sykes Results Driven Mind Trainers. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on The Shift Show. Thank you.